Hi, I'm Monica Olson. And I'm Jennifer Walsh. And you're listening to the Biophilic Solutions Podcast, where every other week we sit down with experts and thought leaders across industries in order to explore the innate connection between humans and nature and why we need nature to thrive. We truly believe that in order to tackle the global environmental problems we're facing, we as humans must reconnect to the natural world and come to a better understanding of how we fit in and how we are so interconnected. So in every episode, we'll interview new guests that help us uncover and highlight nature-based solutions to get us on a path to greater health, tackling climate change, and ultimately getting outside and connecting with nature. So let's get to today's episode. Hey, Monica. Hey, Jennifer. Okay, Monica, tell us about our guest today. You met him this fall at a nature event, and that's how we got him on the podcast. Yes. So our guest today is George Dusenberry, and I met him at a Children in Nature Network event about a month ago at Serenby. And a quick aside, if you want to learn more about the Children in Nature Network, go back to season one, all the way back, and you'll hear a great interview with their executive director, Sarah milligan Toffler. She was there and introduced me to George. So he serves as the vice president of the Southern Region, as well as the Georgia State Director for the Trust for Public Land. Really incredible organization, creates parks and protects public lands so people, everybody can get greater access to the outdoors, which I know is one of your favorite things to talk about, Jen. (laughs) It is. But wait, can we just stop for a second and say, oh my gosh, that was season one with Sarah Milligan Tossler. It was one of my favorite episodes. Well, I have so many of them, but. I'm not going to go on my camp with that was season one. I know. So long ago. It was a long time ago. Uh, Here we are ending season three. Oh, I know. Okay. So yes, I so enjoyed sitting down with George and learning more about his work and about the trust for public land. I didn't really know that much about it, to be honest. And their work is really centered around four key objectives, equity, health, climate, and community. And I think our conversation with George really highlights those exact topics. Yeah. And like many of us, our guests, like he's so good at explaining how all of these areas intersect with each other. And then he gives you like concrete examples of projects that he's personally worked on, which for me, that like really helps me bring it home and understand the impact that these things can make. Ah, exactly. And so in this conversation, we chat with George about green space and essential infrastructure, the incredible Chattahoochee Riverlands project, which promises to transform the Atlanta metro area and well beyond. And we explore the Trust for Public Land's ultimate goal to build green spaces within a 10 minute walk of every urban area in the country. All right. So let's get to our interview with George Dusenberry. Well, George, thank you so much for joining us today on Biophilic Solutions. We're absolutely thrilled to have you. I had the great pleasure of meeting you in person at Sarah B a few weeks ago. And I thought with all your background around the environment and the trust for public land and the role that you hold would be a wonderful interview. And so I welcome you to the podcast. Well, thank you. I'm happy to be here. And George, I'm excited too, because Monica has spoken so highly of you, and I'm very jealous I was not there in Sarah B to meet you with everyone else, but I'm looking forward to our conversation so I can learn more now. It was a great event. Children and Nature Network really had it well organized, and it was fun to get down there and help tell our story about our work with them to help connect people with the outdoors. Yeah, yeah. So let's dive in. You know, I would love for you to share with our listeners the Trust for Public Land, what its mission is, and how the organization, you know, goes about achieving that mission and how long you guys have been around and, you know, you're all across the country, but we'll dive into some local projects. But tell us a little bit about the Trust for Public Land. Well, the Trust for Public Land is a national organization. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year, actually. So we've been around for quite a while. I'm founded in San Francisco, California, but we have offices all over the country, including the one we have here, the Georgia office in Atlanta. Our mission is to uh, preserve land and build parks to connect everybody to the outdoors. The Trust for Public Land believes that access to nature is a fundamental human need. And so we really go about creatively trying to figure out how we can meet that need, working with our public partners across the country. I always emphasize that we're the Trust for Public Land. And so when we talk about public, that means we have to have public access. And and 99% of the time, that means public ownership. So we always have to have public partners. So we work with our partners at the federal level, we work with partners at the state level, and we also work with county and city governments across the country to help get things done. That is a broad overview of what Trust for Public Land does. And then how we do that really, a lot of it depends on the communities that we work with. We look upon obviously having access to the outdoors, 
being outdoors has certain fundamental benefits in terms of your physical and mental health. People who have access to the outdoors are more apt to get out and exercise. And then just being outdoors, you see those benefits in terms of lowering your blood pressure, a lowering stress, increasing cognitive ability, actually even reducing your cholesterol. As odd as that may sound, sitting outside in the woods can help reduce your cholesterol levels. So that, again, there's that fundamental human connection that we want to, to move forward with that. And so for each community, what that looks like is different. And so it comes back to that working with our public partners and working with our community partners to help figure out what that solution is going to look like in their particular jurisdiction or locale. Do you guys have like a local membership where the general public can get involved or are you relying upon all paid employees? We do rely on all paid employees, but we do have certain volunteer opportunities. So we don't have membership per se. Like most nonprofits, we fund ourselves through a combination of philanthropic support from government grants and other grants, and also some fee-for-service opportunities. One thing that benefits us very much is like a lot of nonprofit organizations, we're embedded in the community. And we do work where, you know, as I said, we preserve land, we help work with communities to design parks, and we sometimes can provide funding. We work with local governments to identify and create funding for parks. We help identify where parks are needed most and what type of parks and what type of amenities are needed. And we have this incredible backbone of folks who do a lot of research around parks and green space that help us be more effective in the field. So I may have a relationship with the city of Chattahoochee Hills. I may have a relationship with the state of Georgia. But when I go in to have a conversation with those organizations, I can ask our park experts in New Mexico, our park experts in San Francisco, our park experts in Florida, okay, I need some help raising money. Or they're looking to have a park within a 10 minute walk of everybody. Where are the areas where they need help most? And that is a fundamental trust from public land belief is that everybody should live within a 10 minute walk of a park. You guys down in Serenby, Chattahoochee Hills is almost kind of built into the very fabric of your existence. There are very few cities that are like that. In fact, I think the major cities, Minneapolis and New York City, I believe are the only two cities that have a park within a 10 minute walk of every resident. So it's something we aspire for all the cities across America to do. We even have mapped that. We have a, a park serve tool that you can access off the Trust for Public Land website that will allow you to go to your community and see how many folks actually live within a 10 minute walk of a public park. Wow. Yeah. Yep. That's fascinating. We'll have to put that in our show notes for sure. I want to check that out. Okay. George, I have to ask you because Monica has met you, but I have not, but I read up a lot about you. And I know we always talk about like, how do people get their interest or their beginnings in that love of nature? Wasn't your mom a part of the, was she an <laughs> environmentalist or something? Tell me, tell me about your mom. Well, so my, my mom was a public planner, actually. Okay, okay. And so she worked a lot with communities in terms of more from economic development perspective. Got it. Helping to identify what communities needed to do to improve their quality of life. And so I think that that sense of getting active at the community level of public service is something that I definitely got from my mom. And then just my family in general, it was one of those situations where we spent a lot of times outdoors. Behind our house, it was just undeveloped forest land. You know, now there's subdivisions, as is such the case in so much of America. Of course. <laughs> our traveling, we would camp and do a lot of stuff like that. But I think more for my mom, I had that sense of the role of public government, the role of working with community to really listen understand what the needs are, and then work with them to improve quality of life. And for me, a, more of a leaning into the environment in terms of finding my niche in that space. Yeah. I mean, we always talk about, you know, the podcast or our initial interest isn't climate per se, but everything we do is leading to a, hopefully a better climate, a better environment, because if we don't have it, there is no, if there's no nature, if, if it's not in a healthy place, then, you know, we can't have all these other things. But I love that you brought up that 10 minute walk to green space or a public park. We hear more and more about that. And we even hear about, you know, somebody will use the terms like smart cities or 15 minute walk that people can live within a 10 to 15 minute walk of all of their necessities, Right. And do you find that those are starting to overlap, that necessity isn't just my dry cleaning, but, you know, a public park? Are you finding these overlapping beliefs in city planning? Definitely. This is National Infrastructure Week. And I was actually on a panel yesterday with folks from the Atlanta Beltline, Mayor Dickens, 
Lisa Cupid from Cobb County, we were talking about investments in infrastructure. And I was there to talk about parks and green space. And to me, that was an important validation of parks and green space as essential infrastructure. And we talked a lot about what that means. We talked earlier in this broadcast about the impacts on individual people in terms of your physical and your mental health and your well-being. But parks are also those areas where we run into our neighbors, we meet folks by happenstance. And so you find that people who have access to parks and green space, they know more of their neighbors, they're happier with where they live, they have more friends, they're just happier overall. And so again, when you think about what is essential infrastructure, what is a necessity, that type of quality of life is a necessity and a need. And then we even talked a little bit about climate, about how we make ourselves more resilient for climate. There are a number of ways in which parks help in that benefit. One of the biggest things is if you are in a forested park and then you walk maybe several hundred yards and you're standing in an asphalt parking lot, the temperature can increase by as much as 15 degrees when you do that walk. And when you look at the impact of climate change, if you look at the projections on, in terms of the increased mortality that comes from it, the number one challenge because of climate change is heat. And so here you see parks as essential infrastructure, parks and street trees, to help make cities more resilient to climate change in terms of the factor for heat. And then we also see more severe storms. And you guys may recall about a month ago, a severe storm hit. Yeah. Uh, yep. The Atlanta University Center, Morehouse, Spelman, you know, some places 10, 15 feet underwater. Just It was just a free flash flood, but we're seeing more and more of those with climate change. If you travel less than a mile north from the Atlanta University Center, you come to a community called Vine City. And there is space in Vine City, 16 acres, where in 2002, there was a similar flash flood and 60 families lost their wow. lives. They were, again, mm -hmm. within a matter of an hour, the water rose and it was a combination in that situation, not just of storm water, but it was actually sewer in there. So it was rather disgusting mess. Those families were relocated and Trust for Public Land partnered with the city of Atlanta to build something new called Cook Park. Now, a lot of folks may be familiar with historic Fourth Ward Park on the mm -hmm. east side of Atlanta. And Cook Park is like that. It was designed not just to be this wonderful amenity for the community, provide those benefits we talked about. But when the storms come hard, when you see flooding, it's the park that floods and not the surrounding community. So while the Atlanta University Center was flooding just you know less than a mile south, Buying City, English Avenue were not. Meanwhile, there was 9 million gallons of stormwater in Cook Park. Cook Park was 15, wow. 20 feet underwater in places. Because, again, using parks to make cities more resilient to climate change. So you have the heat and you have the stormwater. And those are really the two most important ways that they do that. So when you do talk about the need to have parks in your community, the ancestral infrastructure, you talk about health, you talk about the social benefits, and then you talk about the climate resilience and other environmental benefits that come from parks. And more and more, we are seeing them being essential infrastructure. I mean, you talk about that 10-minute city. I do like the 10-minute yeah. city concept. That's probably a little biased. Maybe it should be a 10-minute city. But, you know, you need to be able to walk to a park within 15 yeah. minutes. And I think more and more people are seeing and saying that. I love that, well, not only the 10-minute, but changing it from, you know, what we think of as a park as a, maybe an amenity to something that is infrastructure. And I think that that can really start to change people's minds about the importance and the need versus as a nice to have, it's a need to have. Do you see that happening? We do. And what it also does is it opens a door for creative ways of funding mm. information of parks and green space. So when you look at historic Fourth Ward, you look at Cook Park and you look at other parks similar around the country, it's not just the Parks Department or some similar kind of usual green space funding going into it. In those situations, Atlanta's Department of Watership Management invested $10, $15, 20000000 million to help build that park. And what was really unique is particularly with historic Fourth Ward Park is that the city actually saved money by building a park as opposed to the alternative, which was to build this giant underground tunnel. They saved 5 or $10 yeah. million dollars by doing that. And so they saved money and then... They have the same result, and then you have this beautiful amenity for the community to enjoy. So that is one way, you know, the, the creative in terms of funding. But similarly, if you look at something like, say, the Atlanta Belt Line or even some of work Trust for Atlanta is doing along the Chattahoochee, trails actually tap into transportation mm. dollars. And so you can find 
donation dollars to help with land acquisition, to help build greenways, to help build the trails within parks. And you find that funding at the national level, you find that funding at the state level and the local level. So it really opens more doors for communities to fund parks and green space. And then what's also, I think is most important is that you're killing two birds with one stone. So you're allowing, again, you listen to that community, what are your challenges? Are we have trouble with flooding or we're concerned that too many of our elderly residents are exposed to excess heat. How can you solve that? Well, you can solve that by building a park that serves the full community and also meets those goals. And so I think that is the kind of creative conversations that we are seeing take place. I think that's so incredibly amazing on so many levels, because again, this, there's this awareness that you're saying, George, about the infrastructure that Monica, you just said, because also it's not just infrastructure, but then when you talk about in that grand scheme, it's also human health. It's yeah. not just, you know, nice to have, like you said, Monica, but it's for human health. And the more that we are aware and the education, I think, must be key for you because here I'm sitting in New York City and I just got back from my walk in Central Park. But it's this awareness, I think, that what you're doing, George, and your teachings and what you're sharing is that we have to educate one another on why it matters every day mm-hmm. and how it changes not only ourselves, but our families, our communities and our cities and how we must you know, look at things differently in terms of the massive flooding. Like you were just saying, we're experiencing that here in New York City in such profound ways. And people can't wrap their head around it because they don't understand why. Um, You know, it's just like awareness of, yeah, we have to teach why heat, the water damage is is really something to look into. It is. And actually up in New York, across the country, but this all started in New York, Trust for Public Land has this community schoolyards program. And when we talk about access to the outdoors, one of the bigger challenges oftentimes is just finding the land and providing the land, particularly in an urban environment like New York, as you are well aware of. And we look at too many schools, you find two dynamics, particularly in, in the older urban cities, you find that it's, the school is not even surrounded by grass, it's surrounded by asphalt. And mm-hmm. you paint some lines on the asphalt and that's the schoolyard. Right. That you can't be out yep. And then you put it all behind a fence. And when schools close, that fence stays up and the gate stays locked. And you have all that land just sitting there vacant and doing no use. So about 20 years ago, Trust Public Land in New York City started partnering with the school system in the city where we would engage the students to reimagine what that schoolyard would be. And so instead of asphalt, well, let's get rid of the asphalt. Let's put in playing field. Let's put in play space. Let's put in gardens. You know, let's put in some trees. Let's put in some educational opportunities. So we started doing that in New York City. And all told, we've done more than 200 of these wow. schoolyards in New York City. Wow. And after a while, the water department in New York City said, well, you know, what if you were to actually build water retention as part of these schoolyard projects? So actually, the, the water department in New York City is one of our biggest partners, and they help us fund water retention at all of our schoolyard projects. And they, they wow. it's not cheap we do stuff uh-huh. like that, but they're investing like a million dollars a year and the goal is to capture at least the first inch of rainfall that hits that school and schoolyard. So the whole lot is captured on site and it doesn't overwhelm. So yes, you guys have experienced some significant flooding up in York. It would have been worse if not for several dozen schoolyards retaining some of the water. Absolutely. That's really so. interesting. And, you know, thinking about that, that retaining that water and making it an amenity to your point about the old fourth ward park here in Atlanta, which is if you walk around it, it's almost like a pond, right? That then has the ability to not really flood, but rise, right? And take on extra. Is the same thing happening? Like, are they creating sort of amenities in those New York schools? Is it little creeks or like, how are they doing the water retention or is it very standard water retention? It's a little more standard water retention. Land is at such a premium in New York City. You could not do yeah. something like an historic fourth work. You do it in the but you really cannot do the square. So it is much more making sure that all of the surface is pervious, okay. allowing infiltration to take place where it can. But there are some large underground cisterns that are capturing that water and holding it. And some of that water is reused for the, you know, watering the plants and, and stuff like that. But it, New York is such a dense city that it has to really use, if you will, kind of that gray, hard infrastructure. We are working with the Department of Watershed here in Atlanta, actually. And so we actually are doing some of what you're talking about, bioswales, little retention, rain gardens. And so we are integrating that into some of our projects we're doing here in the city of Atlanta. Trust Pup Land has completed eight projects with the city of Atlanta over the last three years. We have a couple more that are designed. We actually are expanding into DeKalb County. We have expanded into Fulton County. And we are always looking to partner with our water departments in those jurisdictions 
and they see the value not only just for helping to reduce the flooding and hold the stormwater at that site, but also to educate kids about climate change, about stormwater, about water retention, about the built environment and how it contributes to flooding and that negative impact in the community around it. Yeah, I always use the example, or at least this is my limited, is a boulder and the Boulder Creek system that they have a trail by it. And then the creek was not covered over and made just a tunnel, kind of like Los Angeles river system was. I just think it's such an amenity and it's infrastructure. And so LA is sort of appears to be trying to figure out what to do with their huge flood control channels. Yeah. And and it is, you know, it's a balance in terms of naturalizing. So a lot of it is you need to have a lot of interventions upstream because by the time you get downstream, it can be a little overwhelming in terms of what happened. One of my first projects while I was at Park Pride was in Candler Park, where we basically daylighted a stream, as you said, and increased its ability to retain stormwater on site. So it was kind of flowing through a concrete, it was a pipe to a concrete culvert and then flew out and eventually made its way down the Chattahoochee River. So we did that. And then what was neat then was that within like a year of us daylighting that stream and getting rid of the concrete and the concrete culvert, beavers wow. moved in. Actually, beavers dammed down. Yeah. So this was Candler Park, so it's a relatively urban environment. And people could come and they could walk. And you'd see people generally out around dawn or dusk going out there looking to see the beavers. <laughs> And so it's a little bit beyond just the stormwater, but it's that whole connection to nature. It's allowing mm-hmm. people to come in and, and reclaim its space. And I think that as we've developed more and more land, it's really important to provide those opportunities for nature to come in and reclaim that space. You know, trust land, we do some daylighting, some naturalization of uh, concrete culverts. I think a lot of communities and cities around the country are starting to do that. They see the value. Before it was like, we need to get the water out of here as quickly as possible. And the realization that we're just flooding other people downstream or other people are flooding us. Right. Same thing. So how can we have more of a natural system? Right. And for someone who doesn't live in Atlanta or even like George, I should say, can you give us, because I mean, I'm more aware of the Chattahoochee Riverlands project, but can you give us a little bit more insight into this exciting new project? Yeah. So gosh, about more than 30 years ago, the Chattahoochee River was named the most endangered river in America by American rivers. And what's also unique about the Chattahoochee is it's a relatively small river. It's a river, but it's a relatively small river. And I think like 6 million people rely on it for the drinking water. And so here we have this water, there was a river that was endangered because of sediment, because we were not doing a good job treating our wastewater. And you had millions of people relying on it. And so Trust Land got involved to start buying land along the Chattahoochee River to protect it from development, to protect the water quality. There's a local organization here called the Chattahoochee Riverkeeper. I know you have a Hudson Riverkeeper up there in New York, mm-hmm. or some more sense. And so they were founded the same year that Trustboro Public Land started its Chattahoochee program. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and I will say that we started that program. We worked with the Nature Conservancy. We went up and we bought 18,000 acres and 80 miles of riverfront along wow. the Chattahoochee to help preserve it. Oh, my gosh. But over those 30 years, the city of Atlanta's population went from, I say the city, I should say Metro Atlanta's population, went from a little over 2 million people to 6 yeah. million people. So suddenly, wow. yes. I mean, oh my God. Atlanta's been a very growing city for quite some time. And you needed to provide amenities for those people to get out and yep. enjoy the river. And because the river had been so polluted and just a number of happenstances, we had this wonderful opportunity to create a 100-mile park along the Chattahoochee River as it flows through the eighth largest metropolitan area in America. So that's what we set out to do. We started partnering with the Atlanta Regional Commission, which is our metropolitan planning organization for the 10 core counties for the city around Atlanta, the city of Atlanta and Cobb County. And we spent almost two years working with 19 cities, seven counties, and probably about four dozen nonprofits and community organizations to reimagine the river, not so much as the dumping ground it used to be, but as the defining public space for Metro Atlanta. If you will, we have a place here called the Atlanta Beltline. You may have heard of it, but it's a transformational rail corridor project. Trust Beltline also played a role in that. That has become kind of our defining urban park. It links a lot, number of really important parks like Piedmont Park is our probably most prominent park here in the state of Atlanta and, and a dozen others. But we see the Chattahoochee Riverlands 
having the impact on the region that the Beltline has had on the state of Atlanta. The Beltline has changed the city, not just physically, but the culture of the city has changed. You see, it's kind of, we, we try more young people. There's more a sense of integrating, as we talked about earlier, the outdoors into your everyday life. Well, the Riverlands are going to do that for the metropolitan region. A great example of that, and we were actually were down in Chattahoochee Hills a couple months ago for a groundbreaking. We are building a 48-mile camp and paddle trail. So you'll be able to spend four days, wow. three nights paddling and camping through metropolitan Atlanta. You start in the city of Atlanta, you end up- That's incredible. <laughs> yeah, but it's really cool. And so right now, where do you do that? I mean, at best, you have to hop in your car. Maybe you have to fly to find some place to do that. And now you can basically- Hop in an Uber. You can make MARTA. MARTA interacts with the uh, Chattahoochee. MARTA is our, our local transit system. And one of my favorites is my Chattahoochee program director, a guy named Walt Ray, talks about how he could drive to the Chattahoochee with his inflatable kayak, inflate it, paddle down as long as he wants, come back out, call an Uber, deflate <laughs> That's amazing. And, he back up. And, you, and you can do that in the eighth largest city in America. And that's just one example of that. So that's part of, if you will, the blue way, increasing access, providing amenities on the Chattahoochee itself. We also are building a whole bunch of new parks. And then there is going to be a multi-use trail that we've mapped throughout the full 100 miles of the Chattahoochee Riverlands that ultimately will be built. We right now are working with Cobb County to build that first 2.7 mile section. And for those who don't know, Cobb County is across the Chattahoochee from the city of Atlanta proper. So they're neighbors. And then we are actually starting to work with the city of Atlanta in terms of working to build out some sections there. Mayor Dickens has been talking about connecting this, reconnecting, if you will, the city to its river for some time now. In fact, he was at that infrastructure conference that I was at, and we were talking a little bit about getting it to the place now where we are connecting the city to the river. And he really is trying to leverage the World Cup that's coming here in 2026. He wants to connect the city to the river by 2026. And we broke ground on our first project with that about a month ago. So it, it's fun. It's a good time to be working on a really transformative project. That's huge. Well, that's really, really exciting. Yeah, I do recall maybe in the planning days getting an invitation that was like, where the F is the river? And I think that it was sort of a funny, <laughs> you know, and it was a call yeah. to come and, you know, help reimagine. But I think that's it. The Beltline was such a transformational idea. and then you know, now in process, this is the next one. And I just, again, I don't think people even understand that there is a river. Like they kind of know, but they either, maybe they up in Roswell, like that's my biggest connection to the river was having a son who crewed on the river in Roswell. And so I'm like, okay, I don't know if we'll ever have a bigger stretch down here, but it's gorgeous up there and the connection's unbelievable. So what if we could all have that? That's exactly what we're looking to do. And, and, you also, I mean, to a certain extent, we talked a little about the pollution in the river, and I think there is an equitable component about this. And if you look north of town, if you look at kind of the more affluent, less diverse, although there's a lot of diversity now in North Atlanta, communities, they do have the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area. They do have better access. Roswell, I think, is the poster child for how to it's the river and put some amenities there. But as soon as you hit Peachtree Creek, which is where... There used to be a lot of pollution. The price still, still is a bit of pollution, but that used to be kind of where the pollution started. Right. And you started flowing down. And that's where the zoning transitioned from residential to industrial. Oh, uh, so okay. They're back on the river and polluting the river. The good news is because of the work of the Chattahoochee River Keeper, and I hope I'll take a little bit of credit because yeah. of the work for Trust Public Land, the Chattahoochee is a river in recovery and you can get out there. You can paddle yeah. it. You can float it. When we were looking to implement the Riverlands, we really are kind of focusing our effort on bringing to West Atlanta, to South Cobb, to South Fulton, to Douglas County, the same access, the same amenities. Actually, yeah. better. I mean, because, you know, we can improve the ones that are north, but let's bring that to the poorer, more diverse yeah. sections of Atlanta and provide them that access too. So that's why Trust Part Land really is focusing its work, if you will, from Beach Street Creek. And so we're just doing a lot of work there. We're excited to be doing that. We're seeing that being embraced also by our local government and our state and federal partners. So that's great. Too. Are you seeing, I mean, this all sounds very exciting because I love talking about this all day long, but are you seeing any pushback though? Like any negative, no, we don't want it, or no, we can't, or just any kind of negativity at all? 
So we've not seen negativity. I think one thing that you're seeing just in general when people talk about green space is this concern that property values will go up and people who live there will somehow be displaced. And what's unique about the Riverlands is that when you get, I talked about that industrial space. And so what happens is north of town, you have a lot of residential space. But when you have industrial space and we get further, it gets pretty rural, you know, when you get down to Chattahoochee Serenity space. So you don't have many people living in there who could be displaced. In addition, as part of our work with the Riverlands, we have this organization called SCAPE. They're wonderful consultants out of New York. You may have, may have heard of them up there. Founder, a woman named Kate Worf, actually got the MacArthur Genius Award for her proposal to use oyster reefs to protect New York City from flooding. Yeah. 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 So she was, she was down here and her team was down here. And we were very intentional about identifying communities near the river that might be subject to gentrification or displacement. And so what's important about that is that we could engage with those jurisdictions ahead of time to say, hey, what is your plan? What are you doing about affordable housing? and what are you doing about retaining your less affluent communities and protecting them? The city of Atlanta has been incredibly creative in terms of the systems and structures and programs that's put in place to help protect affordable housing, protect existing communities in the city. All told, we identified four, if you will, environmental justice okay. communities. And so as we will do our work, that is part of the conversation is we need to be aware of this. How are we looking to protect these communities? Recognizing that jurisdictions who value diversity and want to maintain those residents should be doing this regardless. And, you know, whether they're doing a charity or whether they're doing something, that, that's what it should be. Anyway, that's the only pushback we've, sure. we've had. Other than that, it's more, I want to be first, I want to be first, I want to be first. And if we had a few hundred million dollars, we could probably work with all the partners. Well. Okay, well, we'll put in the show notes how to donate. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it, you it can be popping up along all along from Cobb all the way to Douglas at the same time. I know that there's been a few new put-ins where you can get into the river here in Chat Hills. I think at least one, yes. I think, was inaugurated recently. And so it's only about a mile from us, from Serenby, runs right through Chattahoochee Hills. It's such an amazing opportunity to your point of, yeah, the inflatable or having outfitters on the river that can then rent those kayaks or canoes or whatever tubes that I don't even have to have my own, right? I can rent one and just like pop over for the day, which is something that we think about we have to travel for, right? We have to go to the North Georgia mountains sure. or North New York, it's an incredible project. How far into it? You said you, you're starting your first two point some odd miles in Cobb. Is that like you're literally picking a chunk and doing that? Is that how it's going to work? Yeah, it's similar to the Atlanta okay. Beltline where when people first start talking about okay. the Beltline, nobody had any idea what they were talking about. It's kind of like, oh, what's a sure. Beltline? And they went out and they built the East Side Trail. Oh, that's I a Beltline. See. I yeah. We said, okay, well, we need to show people what the river lands could be. And so- that makes sense. Part of it is this Greenway Trail. And so in Cobb County, it's a 2.7 mile section. And we're building a new, if you will, gateway park on the southern end, which is at the intersection of Mableton Parkway slash MLK. You know, they changed the name to right. across the river, just north of I-20. That's the southern end. And then we will go through an existing 140 acre park and end up at a, just near where Partner Creek hits mm. the river on the Atlantic side. So it's about 2.7 mile sections. In that northern end, it's interesting. When we first started the conversations, it was just a vacant lot. In the meantime, developers have built about 500 apartments and townhouses. There's also a brewery. There's a coffee wow. shop, a barbecue place. There's also actually places for kayaks to be stored. And there's actually a floating dock down there. Wow, field. okay. Building that infrastructure. And part of this is trust what land is not going to build. We need help. Right. So you see, you know, Roswell obviously was way ahead of the curve. They've already built out a lot of their riverlands. But you see Johns Creek and some of the more affluent communities doing this. But also, you need those private developers understanding that, you know, hey, if I have this Chattahoochee Riverlands, I have this trail in these parks, well, people are going to live in my apartments. They're going to shop in my stores. They're going to want to be here and work here. The success of the Beltline has actually helped us have that conversation with developers around the Chattahoochee Riverlands, where they understand that. People need to be connected to the outdoors, that there is this fundamental need for nature, that the Riverlands can provide that. And if they work with the Riverlands, 
that all of their residents or all of their you know workers are going to have that access to nature and outdoors, and that's valuable and important to them. If we found developers give us easements, give them right away, and yeah. helping us get yeah. this. Program. That is I wonderful. Love it, First of all, Monica, can you see his excitement? <laughs> <laughs> George, just watching you speak about this, I know you were not going to see this on our podcast, but your face lights up when you talk about it. And it's just contagious because I get so excited hearing someone else that's so passionate about what they do, and especially when it concerns human health and how we create cities for human flourishing versus what we've been through. To be honest, and I see that now that you're saying all this, I'm seeing that in New York City too. Like there's so much more excitement around the east side and the west that they're building out a lot more access to the Hudson River and the East River and the parks and there are more parks opening and you see a lot more people there just because it makes them feel good and they're happy and accessible to all. There's no charge for people to go to the High Line or Little Island or Central Park. But the other places, like I grew up in the Bronx, we need more. Uh, say, the Bronx River, actually, yes. has got a bit of recovery, too. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah, keep smiling. I just love okay. what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, no, and it's very, this is what we're always like, there's so many cool things happening. I mean, to even say that the Hudson River and the Chattahoochee have been brought back, you know, that there are rivers in recovery over the past 30 years, you know, there is so much doom and gloom. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't take the climate very, very seriously of where we are with carbon. But we need those hopeful stories to keep us going. And, you know, the more we're reconnected, it helps. And one of the things that I read the other day, and I know this is a little bit outside of where you guys are, is the bikes. I think I just read an article on, so the Beltline, everybody's biking on the Beltline as well, which is amazing. And there's a whole bike system, which I'm guessing there will be something for the river will continue on. But New York, Jen, you know, the times that I've been there, you know, over the years, like we've jumped on bikes, those little city bikes. It's amazing how far you can go. We've mostly r r driven on, I guess, maybe the West Side. But I was reading a whole article, was it Paris has completely redefined how people get around? I don't even know what, are you familiar with this at all, George? Like, I am familiar because there was a basically saying that Paris was a city of cars and a city yes. of drivers. And they've gone in and they've basically, interesting, New York City actually is one of, I think, the first cities to really aggressively do this. But they've taken asphalt and they've taken away from cars and they've given it to yeah. bikes. And you are seeing now, I think they're saying, there's still a little, there's so much demand for the bikes that you're actually seeing bike on bike conflict <laughs> in Paris. <laughs> more, more bike I see that. There. I see yeah. that. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I lived in New York, gosh, 30 years ago, and there was no bike infrastructure mm -hmm. whatsoever. Mm -hmm. yeah, I lived in Washington, so I'm a bit of a cyclist myself. And so I would ride my bike to work and there was, it was better there. I moved here. I joked the difference was in Washington, when a car cut you off, there's generally another bicyclist to yell at them for you. And here you're kind of on your own. <laughs> but you are seeing that. I My night job, I am a city of Decatur commissioner. And we have gotten a lot of flack about taking asphalt and turning it into bike lanes or narrowing streets so the pedestrians are feeling yep. safer. Decatur is the most walkable city in Georgia. So we try oh. to take that seriously and, and same with the cyclists. But in regard to the Riverlands, yes, the, that multi-use trail is for cyclists. And then also there's something called the tributary trail. If you will, take a silver climate trail, which is probably more than tributary trail, but there's a big Creek Greenway trail. Sierra B, Chat Hills has its own trail network system. And all these come, they connect into the Chattahoochee River. All told, there are 45 of these tributary trails. So much like tributaries bring water to the river, tributary trails bring people and bikes to the oh, river. I love that. And the concept is you won't have to hop in your car to get to the river. You can ride your bike, walk. And that goes back to the whole, we started talking about the 10-minute yeah. walk. Yes. Um, it's also the concept of the 15-minute bike nice. ride. And like a million people live within a 15-minute bike ride of the Chattahoochee River. And so we can help build that infrastructure. And when we get there, it could be a bit of a trip, but you could spend quite a while riding up and down. Maybe somebody from Roswell wants to come down and visit you down in, in <laughs> Serenby. Something hopefully not too distant future, they will be able to hop on their bike. Yeah, especially that. with e-bikes now, you know, Incredible. if you aren't, you know, not to, I mean, I, we have a, one of each, but I will say like on Hill, they're long distances. It's kind of nice. Oh. It's I used to at cheating. I've ridden one. I was riding to work. I was on Freedom Parkway here in Atlanta. And I passed this person. And I come to the hill. And I'm like just hopping up the hill. 
And this person, he's riding his bike. It's like he's Mary Poppins. He's not even sweating. He's <laughs> it's a great laughing. feeling. It, it is. And so I think e-bikes are great. It's, it's, and it, yeah. it's getting a lot more people exactly. out there. I think it's yes. like lowering the threshold for people to feel comfortable in their bikes. I do think e-bikes are great. You see that on the Beltline, like this, the demand for using the trail there. I mean, it's almost like it's too crowded with e-bikes and scooters, normal bikes, loggers, runners. Trails are the thing. And I will say that the Path Foundation here in Atlanta is a wonderful job in terms of helping us build a lot of this yeah. out. No, it's absolutely thrilling. As somebody who has been here for a little over 20 years, came from San Francisco and transportation in San Francisco is a little hit or miss, but we walked a ton in the city, even with the hills. Yes. But you just didn't have that opportunity when we moved here. We were like, but Midtown has changed everything and Buckhead is starting to get sidewalks and downtown, obviously Decatur's always been, you know, really a bellwether. So as we're wrapping up, like how can our listeners help you besides writing million dollar checks, which I'm sure they all have ready to go, <laughs> but like, what can they do for the Trust for Public Land to support your work? You know, learn more about us. So you go to our website, tpl.org, right. which is a simple way to do that. And then we do have volunteer opportunities. So we actually, as part of our work on the Riverlands, there's also ecological restoration mm. part of that. So we're working with George okay. Audubon. I think George Audubon may be changing his name sometime soon, but we'll call him George Audubon okay. for now. And removing invasive species, trying to create habitat for birds, putting in some green infrastructure, bio rails, rain gardens, stuff like that. So we actually are doing that in and around Serenby because we have a couple of parks that we're doing mm -hmm. as part of our Camp and Paddle Trail. So if you go to tpl.org, there's a Georgia web page. You can also, if you're specifically interested in the Chattahoochee, there's a chattahoocheeriverlands.com webpage, and you can sign up and find ways to volunteer and get active in that space too. So we do have volunteer activities for folks to get involved with. And yeah, we'd love the million dollar check. Heck, we'll sell for the hundred thousand dollar check. <laughs> but find a way to get involved in your own community. What Trust Public Land, the community is at the center of everything we do. Every community is unique. And there is more than enough need, even in a community like Serenby, although I definitely see people feeling the demand, for people to volunteer, to get involved, to advocate for parks and green space, to pick up a shovel, plant a tree, just whatever it is. And so I would encourage you to, to look close to home. I think that that connection between people and the outdoors, that fundamental need that we have, is best satisfied close to where nice. you are. And so I, I agree. Encourage, really encourage you to do that. And as you're doing that, I started off talking about how we're a national organization. We have all this data. We have all this information. We can help you help your city. So I talked about ParkServe. If you go to our webpage, you just look around. We can work with cities in terms of figuring out how they can raise mm -hmm. money. We don't raise the money for you. We can help you show how you can raise the money. We may know some grant opportunities that may be available. We can tell you where the highest need for parks are. We can do a lot of work with you on that. So we try to actually empower communities to get involved and do that. So that's a powerful way that you can get involved. And it's instead almost like you helping TPL, which again, we welcome, TPL also yeah. wants to help you. So go to our webpage, take a look around, and you can always reach out to me, george.dusenberry, D-U-S-E-N-B-U-R-Y. I've learned uh -huh. I need to spell that. <laughs> at tpl.org. And I'd be more than happy to you know have a conversation, understand what your passions are. I've always been motivated by, uh, you know, Edmund Burke had a quote saying, I might not quite get this right, but nothing is sadder than he who did nothing because they could only do a little. Uh... Just recognizing, we start off talking about climate change and climate change is incredibly overwhelming. But if you want to do something about climate change, plant yeah. a tree. I tell my kids, you want to make the world a better place? Pick up a piece of trash. It's not that yeah. hard. You're not going to solve all the problems, but you can make a difference. And TPL wants to help folks make I a difference. I love it. Oh, I do too. Thank you so much, George, for your time and your passion and your knowledge about what you do and how we can all be an active part, small or big. Thank you for your time today. Well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. Oh, our pleasure. Jen, ask not what you can do for the Trust for Public Land, but ask what the <laughs> Trust for Public Land can do for you. <laughs> oh my God, I love that so much. Same. <laughs> so after we wrapped up the interview with George, we actually went back and looked over TPL's website a little bit more. And I promise you, there are so many great resources to help people get started in their own communities to try and have more parks and parkland.
100%. And there are so many ways to get involved in policy decisions. The Land and the People Lab, which is a TPL think tank, you can reach out to directly and an entire resource library is there. It's really, really extensive. Yeah. And I really love that, George, what he said about not needing to do everything, but just do something, right? I think we get so overwhelmed with like all the problems in the world and how can we actually have any effect as an individual But I really think we encourage everybody to head to the show notes, check out all the things that they're doing and just like get started and maybe start thinking about that one thing that you could do. Oh my gosh, I could not agree more as usual. So I also want to touch on this idea of green spaces as essential infrastructure, because I think it really drives home those four key objectives we talked about earlier. Yeah. And so like a refresher on those, which I think are super, super important. And again, very intertwined equity health, climate, and community. So great how he weaves it all together. Oh my gosh. We looked at these ways that access to nature impacts health and has these pro-social community-wide impacts as well. But the example George gave about parks collecting stormwater and shielding communities from the impacts of climate change were also so interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And I was really happy that he addressed gentrification as sort of later in the conversation around like any of the projects, but the Riverlands particularly, to provide access to the river, you don't want to have unintended consequences with these types of initiatives where people just suddenly, there's no equity. So I was glad to hear there's a really strong awareness with this project and how they're really trying to think about how their work can have recognition with the jurisdictions to address these issues early rather than getting caught flat-footed at a later date and like not really having an answer to these problems that crop up. Absolutely. And I think the more we can see green space as essential infrastructure with a wide reaching public benefit versus a nice to have amenity, we might be able to further avoid those really negative unintended consequences more and more. I mean, I hope so anyways. Yeah, me too. So head over to our show notes. We have links, all the resources we've talked about and some more general information about George and the Trust for Public Land. All right. Talk to you soon, Monica. Bye, Jen. Thanks so much for listening. And if you're enjoying the podcast, we would love for you to follow us on your favorite podcast app. Give us a five-star rating and please leave us a review. It really goes such a long way towards helping us reach a wider audience and sharing these amazing interviews and solutions with the world. Absolutely. So thanks so much for following and reviewing the podcast. And we'll be back with another amazing interview in two weeks. You're now a part of the biophilic movement.